payers had not thought very much about atopic dermatitis and its management for the past several years because there had not been the introduction of any new therapies that were really that effective or different from previous ones. It mostly had been uh, drugs that were either off-label or topical agents that had limited effectiveness. Now we have improvements in outcomes because of more effective and targeted interventions. This not only got everybody's attention, but it provides an opportunity to find out which patients need these and which patients need other sources sorts of interventions, and also it means that we're now paying more attention to how to measure patient outcomes and success. So there are lots of measures that are used in the clinical trials, but like many other measures in clinical trials, these are not particularly useful all the time in clinical practice because they require more time to administer, are somewhat more specialized, and might require training to use them. So we really need approaches to measurement that work in an everyday practice setting for patients and doctors without taking up a lot of time. So some of the things that we need to focus on is uh, how can we ask patients to help us with this as opposed to putting it all on a practitioner to make these measurements because a lot of what we're doing for patients now with the newer therapies is improving sleep, reducing pruritus or itchiness, and other things that are patient-reported anyway. We also really need to look into how to use physician global assessments or physician global assessments plus other things and provide these as tools. This helps us to understand which patients need to move on to a more complex or expensive intervention, but also tells us if the interventions that they're on are working or if there needs to be some change in the protocol or in their treatment strategy. So adverse events have always been part of the P&T and health technology review for a number of reasons. So part of it is that it is difficult to prefer an agent that has a lot of adverse events. You would like to open things up if there's a great deal of adverse events and let doctors and patients have more decision-making power because they are at the level of where they can assess benefit and risk for that individual patient, something that health plans don't really do and is difficult to do if you're not the treating physician. So adverse events really matter in terms of making choices for treatment. Adverse events or perhaps less serious adverse events, but those that really have to do with the tolerability of the drug are also important because if a patient can't stay on therapy because they don't tolerate one of the side effects, that is not only costly, but it means that you probably need to go down some other pathway for treating that particular patient. Quality of life is an important measure, and I had already mentioned that pruritus, sleep, and some other things associated with atopic dermatitis are really important to patients. And so we have to look at quality of life as being a subset of clinical benefit for the patient and examine how the patient's life has changed. And this makes the outcomes real. If the patient's skin is clearing and the patient is sleeping better and the patient's functioning better, this all goes together. So quality of life does not live by itself but is really part of the overall clinical picture and the improvements that you want to see for patients. Health plans still look at route of administration as a convenience issue unless it's very difficult or somewhat complex and hard to deliver a medication. We are becoming more used to both oral medications for complicated diseases, but also self-injectables and, and many other diseases that now have IV treatments. So route of administration is taken into account in terms of accessibility, in terms of cost, but in terms of convenience, we are really looking more at the clinical and less at is it convenient for the patient to take it. All patients have responsibilities for out-of-pocket expenses regardless of what disease they're being treated for or what interventions are being used. The out-of-pocket expenses that are then added up and we make sure that when they hit their out-of-pocket maximum that they no longer have liability for those sorts of things. The copay assistance programs have changed this in that they do help patients with very expensive medications to receive their medication. 
However, it also means that if those patients get to their out-of-pocket maximum without having made a significant contribution on their own, this seems unfair to those patients who have interventions that aren't covered by patient assistance programs, say their expenses had to do with surgery, going to the hospital, and things like that. And also it means that without a patient liability, that is when they hit their maximum, then patients have less incentive to choose lower cost but appropriate sites of care for other care, like going to the hospital, getting a scan, choosing a laboratory, and those sorts of things. However, I think that the debate here is because we have a lot of expensive therapies, and it may be that the patient's liability for many things is just too high, that their out-of-pocket expenses are hard for them to pay, leading to lower adherence rates. So we need to ask the question, why are there copay assistance programs? And in this case, a lot of it has to do with the affordability of the intervention. And we need to, I think, rethink how we ask patients to contribute. It seems fair that patients who are using resources should contribute something, but uh, it may be that what we're asking them to contribute is now too much. So risk-based contracting and value-based contracting have been in the news for some time. And in risk-based contracts between payers and pharmaceutical manufacturers, there's an attempt to put some of the financial risk for the performance of the drug back on to the manufacturer. So one way that this is done is if a patient does not stay on the drug long enough and then you assume that it's either not working for the patient or that it uh, has too many side effects or something that the patient can't tolerate. And so in that case, a refund of all or a portion of the cost has been negotiated. In many ways, this is sort of like sampling in order to see if the patient responds. And so you manage your formulary about the same with this sort of thing in progress, but it might be part of a broader arrangement to get the particular pharmaceutical to a preferred tier or to make sure that it has the prior authorization that is appropriate. In value-based contracting, you're looking more broadly at outcomes for the patient. It might be down the road that you're looking for something, whether the drug keeps the patient out of the hospital or delivers some other measurable outcome. And again, it doesn't probably change the formulary placement that much, but management of the formulary might change because you may, in this instance, allow for a longer trial of therapy because you know that if it's not working for the patient after a certain period of time, that there could be a true up in terms of cost. But also, this is more of a partnership in terms of actually looking at outcomes. And in many ways, an outcomes or value-based contract is really both a contract and a real-world observational study of how patients are doing. So we have to look for the appropriate outcome for an outcomes-based or value-based contract. Uh, it has to be something that everybody can agree on that can be measured for most patients to avoid there being some sort of bias. And so oftentimes in these contracts, payers really want to use things that are in the claim system. But in atopic dermatitis, a lot of the really relevant items are not in the claim system because they really have to do with how well the patient is doing. And so I would recommend here a combination of patient-reported outcomes, a physician global assessment, and then whether or not a patient resumes the use of or begins the use of some other systemic therapy. So it's always unclear exactly how much patients are using the topical therapies, and it's not an unusual to see a biologic and a topical therapy being used together for some period of time. So I wouldn't worry about topicals, but I'm thinking here other systemics. And I would look at all of these factors and you can decide how to weight them. Patient reported outcomes have rarely been used in these contracts or for a lot of other things in the past. But now that we have many more people with smartphones or internet connectivity, uh, we can really get, I think, more information from patients. And most patients are willing to share as long as it's not an onerous burden. And if, if once a month or something, we ask them about sleep, about itchiness, about skin clearing, I think those would be important outcomes. Uh, and certainly that's the sort of thing that physicians and patients care about. Well, right now, 
payers read the ICE reports as part of their data collection and gathering of information for drug review. And so they don't necessarily take the findings and make that into clinical policy. They generally don't make use of the cost-effectiveness analysis directly. So they really use it as a tool. Do we look at the right comparators? Are we thinking about the right outcome? Are we thinking over a reasonable period of time and comparing what we're doing to what ICER has been doing? But ICER's impact is going beyond just the individual reports to a broader discussion of how we do drug evaluation, of the value of interventions in healthcare, to the use of more sophisticated economic tools like cost-effectiveness analysis. And I think that those things over the next few years will have some impact, perhaps a significant impact, on payer decision-making because they allow us to talk not just about cost, but about are we appropriately paying for values. We've got two things which is right now using them to understand evaluation of particular drugs and in the future perhaps changing the way that we consider a drug value. Most payers have been successful in fitting the new biologics of various sorts for different indications, asthma, atopic dermatitis, a wide range of things, into their current formulary schemes. But one of the problems has been, are they being used in a way, not just an appropriate way by label, but are they being used in a way that really brings their value out, that finding the right patients, keeping those patients on the drug, evaluating that it's working for them. So there's a lot of other things that need to be done to really bring out the value of any intervention, and especially pharmaceuticals. So clinical pathways are part of that. So pathways began a few years ago in oncology, complex area with many different drugs and lots of different choices and ways to go. We're starting to see that move over now to other categories like autoimmune diseases. There are a wide range of choices and several different mechanisms of action for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. And so we're beginning to see pathways there because of all of this choice that patients have and because different patients probably have different needs. You need some way of sort of determining those. Those pathways are also beginning to come into place for asthma. For many years, we've had disease management programs in asthma asthma, and now with multiple biologics in the asthma area, we're seeing more of these sort of pathways. The pathways are being used mostly by specialists, sometimes in the patient-centered medical home setting, and those companies that have been doing oncology pathways, some of them are now branching out into pathways for other areas. So I think that it's becoming a more ubiquitous sort of strategy. And in part, it's a really good thing here because it involves the physician much more directly in the decision-making, and so it allows for health plans to pass some of that policy-making and utilization management on to the providers themselves where they are much closer to the patient decision-making. Talk to patients. We should provide our members and the patients with tools for self-assessment and monitoring in a number of different areas, including areas like atopic dermatitis, where the patient reported outcomes are really important. And this should be able to come back and inform our decision-making in a number of areas.